So the Apostles' Fast is really, well, St. Jerome, at his time, he referred to it as Summer Lent. Um, it was not practiced with the same strictness that you would call Lent, but, um, you know, some people refer to other Lents. That is a term, you know, there's a there's the Advent Lent, there's the, the Fast Before Christmas, there's obviously Great Lent, which is the, the, the Lent you would know before Easter. Uh, there's um, Assumption Lent, which we would call the Assumption Fast in August, which, which we talked about before. But in, in June, we have Summer Lent, the Apostles Fast. So this, this period actually goes back to St. Leo the Great. St. Leo the Great referenced it in one of his works uh, back in the year 461. So this is from the sermon that, that he gave on the Whitsun Fast. So this is not something you know we're making up today. This is not something new. This long predates the schism with the East. Uh, St. Leo the Great is referring to a solemn fast where he says today's festival, and he's referring to Pentecost, hallowed by the descent of the Holy Ghost, is followed, as you know, by a solemn fast, which being a salutary institution for the healing of soul and body, we must keep with devout observance. And then he goes on to talk more at length. So you can, you know, read this. This is, um, uh, what is it, Sermon uh, 78, I believe? Yeah. Yeah, 78. 78. And he goes on and talks about that. Of course, we also have the Ember Days, too, at this time of year. So, you know, the Ember Days are occurring during the Octave of Pentecost. Uh, the Octave of Pentecost actually was was not, um, you know, practiced in the very early church. You know, uh, if you, we uh, look at the article that I wrote uh, for, um, for 1 Peter 5 before, it actually talks about in the very early centuries, just Pentecost Sunday itself was celebrated in the Western church. By the seventh century, the whole week began a, a time of festive observance, uh, so much so that they did not allow servile work. Um, law courts did not sit. Really, the whole week was a week of um, a holy day of obligation, really, the whole week. Uh, and now by uh, 1094, the Council of Constance limited the prohibition to three days. So we probably talked about before, if you read my articles, Pentecost Monday and Tuesday and Pentecost Sunday were holy days of obligation. And then you would have the Ember Days immediately afterwards. Now, us Roman Catholics, you know, traditional Catholics should be familiar with that. We have the Ember Days this week. And some people are really surprised to see why are we fasting and abstaining during, you know, the very last days of, you know, the Paschal season, because we still play, we're still uh, praying uh, the Regina Chaley. We're not switching back to the Angelus until after uh, known of this coming Saturday, Ember Saturday. Right. Um, so there's there's still going to be that. We're still in the Paschal season. But the church in her mindset really emphasizes how this is a joyful fast. This is not one. So the notion that fasting has to be sorrowful. Remember, our Lord told the apostles, you know, to not look sorrowful like the hypocrites. You can fast with joy. So after just, uh, you know, St. Leo talks about this, you can read that sermon for more information. But the apostles, after receiving the Holy Ghost and being inspired, you know, had this fast before they went out and preached and continued that mission that our, that our Lord sent them to do. And of course, obviously, they were very successful in that. So us as Roman Catholics, we keep that. We keep the Ember Days. But the only real vestige of the old Apostles Fast that used to be kept for a long time is the Vigil of St. Peter and Paul. So we can talk about that in, in a few more minutes. But holistically, then, what is the Apostles Fast? Well, thankfully, some Eastern Catholics do still keep that. And um, it does vary a little bit. For instance, the traditional Byzantine fast during this time um, refers to it lasting anywhere from nine to 42 days. And of course, that depends on the date of Easter. So mm -hmm. there's obviously going to be different amount of dates between this time of Pentecost and uh, between, uh, you know, the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul on June 29th. So that's why it could be anywhere from, from nine days to 42 days. Traditionally, it begins on the first Monday after Pentecost until the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul. So after the octave finished, because the octave is really just an entire celebration of Pentecost, that Monday afterwards, which we would call the Monday after Trinity Sunday, would be the day in which this fast would begin. Now, in the East, they have different rules for different fasts. You know, some allowed oil, some allowed fish, some didn't. So for those familiar with the Eastern tradition, this, uh, this Lent, this Apostles' Fast, this Summer Lent, has the same rules as Great Lent, but oil and fish are allowed in some places, except not on Wednesdays and Fridays. 
Um, there is, though, just to, just to note, a little bit of divergence even in the Eastern churches. For instance, the Coptic and the Old Syrian traditions keep the fast still on that first Monday after Pentecost, as I mentioned in the traditional Byzantine fast. But the current Byzantine tradition, if you'll look that up, they'll actually refer to it beginning on the second Monday after Pentecost. So the first Monday, it begins on the day after their All Saints Sunday. So okay. even even in the East, there might be some difference. The Orthodox are still going to be uh, ones who, you know, probably mention this fast much more than Catholics do. Of course, not everybody who's Orthodox keeps this. Sometimes it's just monks keeping, you know, these different fasts and the ordinary people don't. So it fell out of practice for Roman Catholics a very long time ago. Even though St. Leo talks about it, it goes back, like I said, to the year 461. It really fell out of observance early on. And we just kind of kept that... Uh, that vestige of it with the Ember Days and then the Vigil of Pentecost, uh, the Vigil of Saints Peter and Paul. Now there are other days in June too. We have uh, the Vigil of the Nativity of John the Baptist, which is going to be on uh, June 23rd. That is a day we can and should keep as a day of fasting and abstinence, as well as Corpus Christi's Vigil too. So people might be initially surprised when you're talking about a Vigil of Corpus Christi. I have my traditional missal. I have my you know pre-55 missal. I don't see a Vigil of of Corpus Christi. Um, and, and that would be true. There, there is not a liturgical vigil of Corpus Christi, but I'm talking about vigil in the sense as the day before Corpus Christi. And the church has referred to this before. If you pick up an old copy, you know, of the Recolta in there, there's a different indulgences attached to fasting and other disciplines connected with the vigil of Corpus Christi. So, for instance, this goes back to Pope Urban IV, and this, uh, which is around the year 1429. Uh, it was confirmed as well by uh, Pope Eugenius IV in 1433, where he um, he confirmed these indulgences. Martin V had also indulgences associated with Corpus Christi. But the one I wanted to highlight is in the Recolta, it said there was an indulgence of 200 days on the vigil of the feast of Corpus Christi to all who being truly contrite and having confessed shall fast or do some other good work and join them by their confessor. So this, this also is occurring during this you know, ancient period of the Apostles' Fast.